showtime. Like the night is young. Welcome everyone to the Rosie and Bill Show. In the spirit of Waylon, Willie, and Chris, our guest this week does things his way, and he's unapologetically country. You know, it's been said that if they took Waylon, Hank Jr., Vern Gosden, Conway Twitty, Keith Whitley, a dash of Willie, put it all into a pot, stirred it up, You'd come up with the man we're excited to have with us here tonight, Tommy Townsend. Tommy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, guys. Tommy, I want to take things back a little bit. When you were a teenager, we understand that your parents took you to a Waylon Jennings concert, and that kind of shaped the course of your life. How did they get you backstage to meet him, and and what was that experience like for you? Because he had a pretty big impact on you. Yeah, he did. uh, Well, you know, my dad my dad was a musician and everything. And then, you know, they, they are big country music fans. And so, um, yeah, uh, I, re- I remember that night and when I saw the show, it's like, I want to do that. <laughs> That's what I want to do, you know? <laughs> so anyway, a um, he- uh, couple of Hell's Angels um, used to do security um, for Wayland. And so my mom and dad got, just got to talking to, to one of them that was kind of standing, you know, out in front of the gate backstage and, and they said, yeah, I said, our son, a huge Wayland fan, and and um, said, um, you know, just this and that. And they said, well, cool. So Wayland loves kids and said, uh, bring Tommy down here after the show, and we'll take you back to meet him. And so they took me down there, and and sure enough, uh, he came out and took me back there. And I don't know, I was went on the bus and stayed with them, you know, 30 minutes, 30, 40 minutes, I guess. And what was just as nice as he could be. And, and, uh, you know, we would talk music and, and stuff. And, and, uh, it was just, you know, that's probably the, one of the coolest moments of my life, you know, to get to meet him through one of your heroes. Were you heavy into playing music yourself at that time? Yes. Um, I had been playing, well, I, I started playing drums when I was like five years old, you know, in uh my cousin's uh like square dance band and stuff you know and my dad played bass guitar and so i played drums so yeah i was i was i don't i don't ever remember a time that i wasn't into music um it's just always been a part of my life you know i mean it's you know you know when i'd hear music just the whole world would stop you know and i'd listen whatever it was you know i mean whether it was country or bluegrass or my sister she was uh um she's several years older than me and she was into the like seventies rock and not, you know, Fleetwood Mac and Steve Miller band and the Eagles and all that. And I, I love that too. I liked it all. But, you had a healthy appreciation. Talk to us about the evolution of your relationship with Waylon Jennings, because I understand that he and Jerry Bridges um, co-produced your first solo session. How did that yeah. come about? Yeah, I had uh, well, you know, when I, I met Waylon and that was like in the, uh like 83 some 82 83 something like that and so got to, you know got to you know know Waylon and and kind of go to shows whenever they were in the Atlanta Chattanooga area or something and so got to know the band and the crew and 
I met Jerry, I remember, at, when Willie Nelson had his um, 4th of July picnic uh, in at Atlanta Motor Speedway uh, one year. And so we got talking to Jerry and stuff. And, and I, had, I had given Waylon a tape sometime around that I just, you know, a little tape that I had recorded sometime around that time. And um, so uh, Jerry, uh, he first took me in the studio when I was like a senior in high school. And, and that's actually when Southern, we cut Southern Man then at that time. And, and then, then it was a few years after that, that, uh, that Waylon and Jerry got involved. And then we took Southern Man and recut it. And um, so, yeah, that's just kind of how it all evolved. You know, when Jerry was recording me, just, you know, producing me him and Waylon was home some, so he just like brought by the studio and just hang out, you know? And then, and then after that's when Waylon was like, well, I kind of, I'm, I guess I want to get involved with this too. So, so that's how that all came about. Uh, Were you nervous yeah. with him just hanging out? No, you know, I really <laughs> wasn't because at, at that time I had been around him quite a bit, you know, here and there. And um, so, no, I would I was never, uh, it's really funny. I was never nervous around him. He just made me always feel at ease. And, and, but Waylon was the type of person that he made a lot of people nervous, just, you know, the outlaw image. And it was so funny because somebody told me one time that uh, I guess it may have been uh, Jerry or Richie Albright or somebody that it was so funny because kids would gravitate toward Waylon and just, you know, show him affection and jump up in his lap and everything. And he scared adults to death, you know? And so I don't know, uh, but I've, I've seen it even with my children, you know, um, when they, they were little, you know, um, there's a, there was a picture of, we were at Dollywood and, um, my daughter was two and she was just crawling all over him on the couch and stuff. And, uh, she what was so funny. was she, uh, she, Megan, she's a plot kid and everything. And he was talking. And he told, and she told him to shut up. <laughs> and I thought my wife was going to have a heart attack, you know, and, and uh, he goes, he goes, what, what did you say? And honey, and he goes, and she goes, oh, shut up and says, oh my, he goes, that's the first time anybody's ever told me to shut up. <laughs> but yeah, you know, both my, both my daughters, they just, they love on him and, you know, just like nothing, you know, when, like I say, when they say when adults was around him, it scared them to death, you know, he had a great, great demeanor that, that a lot of people don't know about, you know, and, and two, I've heard people say that, oh, I, you know, I remember seeing Waylon one time and he was so drunk, he couldn't even sing and play. And what they never knew is Waylon never drank. He was not a drinker. So why did they think he was drunk? I don't, I don't know, just his way, just how he, you know, carried himself and everything, you know, and, uh, uh, but no, he, he never, he never was a drinker. I think they're kind of the last, he would drink a beer every now and then or a, a little salty dogs or something, but he, he never was a drinker. Now the, I think the drugs was a different story, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like, maybe that's it. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it, you know, but, but, um, but no, he never was a drinker. I never, I never, I, anytime I was ever around him, I never saw him touch uh, alcohol. I'll tell you one time, um, and as you're talking about all those things with Waylon, th there was a time when I, I thought I was going to have a chance to see him. And this was back in the mid-90s, 94, 95 time frame. Mm -hmm. And I had a, a, a song that played on local country radio, and I got to go to a lot of country shows. And that's really the time that I got in the country, because in, in Philadelphia, there actually was a pretty successful country station, and a lot of big acts would come here. Mm -hmm. And there was this venue called the Valley Forge Music Fair. It held about 2,000 people. The stage would go around in a circle. It was mm -hmm. every seat in the place was perfect. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And I had front row seats for Waylon, and Marty Stewart was the opening act. Uh -huh. And right when the show was supposed to start, someone comes out and says, folks, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but Waylon won't be able to play tonight. He's apparently had a stroke, and the doctor said he can't play. Oh, my gosh. 
And there was this collective sigh. Like it was, it was everybody, like 2,000 people shocked. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the guy comes back and says, Marty Stewart has graciously agreed to play a full two-hour show. If you want to stay, stay. If you want a refund, go to the box office. Not a single person left. Marty and the superlatives played like three hours. Oh, that's we awesome. all went over to a bar and restaurant called Popcorns after, and I hung out mm -hmm. with Marty till they closed. Yeah. And as devastated as I was that I didn't get to see Waylon, Marty kind of he, he kind of saved the day. It was a pretty mm -hmm. amazing, amazing thing. And, yeah. and unfortunately, I never did get to see Waylon, but I became a lifelong fan of Marty Stewart that night. Oh yeah, yeah, Marty, Marty was great, and uh, like I told you, uh, Marty played on one of the tracks on the on the album. Wow, that's I can't yeah. wait to hear that. That's yeah, that's the mandolin. Yeah, and and he, he really comes through right at, right at the end of the song. You know, you can tell it's uh, it's him playing. But yeah, he, he came in under that morning and had a had a leather jacket on, and uh, um, it was kind of clanging against the mandolin, you know, and stuff. So <laughs> when he was in the in the studio, wow. so, yeah. Well, well, I wanted to ask you about uh, another album before we talk about your latest one. And this is one that, um, you know, since 2008, you've been performing with, the, you know, Waymore's Outlaws. Mm -hmm. And along the way, you built a relationship also with, with Shooter, Waylon's son. Yeah. And lo and behold, this kind of culminates not all that long ago with the two of you working on the Turn Back the Clock album. Yeah. So, how did that come about and what was that experience like putting that album together? Well, we, uh, you know, we toured with Shooter for what, four years, five years, something like that. And uh, we, and as you know, Waymore's Outlaws uh, started in 2008 and they wanted to go back out and tour again. So they had asked me if I would front the show for them. And, uh, it, and, you know, of course it was all the guys that played on the records and on the road with Waylon um, at various times. Um, but, uh, so um, we did that, and, and then uh, Shooter came on board with us and, and started working with us. And I, that was in 2013, I believe. We did a couple things, and then and it just kind of escalated from there. And we were, we were doing, I don't know, uh, probably 60, 70 shows a year for three years, I know, uh, with, with Shooter. And so it's so cool. You know, Shooter's, uh, he's uh, uh, probably 10 years younger than me. Or whatever and um so I, I remember him you know as a kid or whatever but i just had the utmost respect for him for how he how he handled things and you know there's no ego there nothing and uh what was so funny was you know way more outlaws we'd do our part of the show and then we were shooters backing band and um i remember one night we were talking because ben shooter and uh uh adam which uh was doing our tour managing and stuff which was Jerry's grandson, which he manages Adam now and manages me. Um, but uh, we'd all just kind of hang out in the hotel room or something after the show or, you know, go someplace and quiet and talk and, you know, have a couple of beers or something. And, and um, so uh, we were talking one night and, and she was like, man, I, I had just, I, I like backing you up and letting you sing and let me just play. And I said, that's, I said, that's funny you say that because I feel the same way because I, you know, and my uh, the way more Zalos part, I was the front man, you know, and then when Shooter came, I was the guitar player and the and the backup singer, and I enjoyed doing that, you know, just playing, being a player. And but Shooter uh, always loved my electric guitar rhythm that I did, and so you know, he had mentioned to me, but he's like, you know, I'd like to take you in the studios and cut some stuff on you. That's when Shooter was kind of getting into being a producer and that's what he always wanted to do more than the live thing and uh so we went out to la and uh recorded the stuff for you know shooter lives in la and uh, he works at the studio out there quite regularly and uh when so when we went in uh we just listened you know we'd i played songs i'd written he had you know pitched me songs and stuff so after shows we just kind of listened to it and we kind of put it together during that time, you know, probably in 2014, I guess, because we were on the road quite a bit. And then we actually started in the studio uh, right around Christmas time in 2015. Went out there and we cut some tracks and stuff. And uh, so, but doing that, we didn't use a whole band to cut the, the tracks. It was just me playing rhythm, electric guitar, uh, the bass player and a drummer. 
and we build it from that. So, uh, yeah, Shooter, Shooter's, he is, uh, he is top notch in the studio and easy to work with. Also on that album, you have a song called Plug That Jukebox Back In. Yeah. Uh-huh. And there's a, a really cool line in there that says, um, let's, welcome let's welcome the future without losing the past, which yeah. to me is, it's profound on many levels. I want to know what the message in that is for you. Well, it was, it's just, you know, let's, let's don't forget how it all started, you know, with the old jukeboxes that you, and I, you know, I remember, I remember those a little bit, the ones you put a quarter in and play, you know, and now you got the ones you, you put your credit card in and, and have an app on your phone. You know? <laughs> Did you ever have the ones when you're sitting at the diner and you turn the pages and, and you you know, they have them at, at, in every booth, they had a, a, a ju little jukebox. It seems like I do maybe a, like a, <laughs> something like maybe a steak and shake. I, I think they're mostly, I think for show that I never did remember those when they were in a booth or whatever, <laughs> you know, say, but, but, uh, I can I can remember even you know in in my in Blairsville in my hometown that uh, like the Tasty Freeze or something or some you know old restaurant would have it you know uh, and I remember you know play it play it in the jukebox back then you know but that's kind of what that message is it's, you know let's let's uh, you know remember what country music where it started or whatever you know and but that even transcends country music. I mean, it's, yeah. it's really a mm -hmm. life thing. That's that's what I love about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, now we talked earlier, Tommy, about about Southern Man and how that was actually that the story of that song started many years ago, mm -hmm. and then it was recently re-released along with a really really cool video that also features Waylon as as well as you in it. So yeah. How did how did we get to where the song was 20 years ago to it being reborn and coming out and sounding so incredible. That was just a fluke conversation that happened with, uh, with uh, Audium Records, uh, Chuck Rhodes. He's the general manager uh, in Nashville. Um, they had actually, Craig Campbell, uh, you know, my good friend, um, he had ran into Chuck Rhodes this is kind of going back just a little bit, if you don't mind me talking about it, but um, back about a year ago, I guess. And so they had resurrected the Audium label, Chuck Rhodes and a couple more people. And so Craig, uh, knowing Chuck and had worked with him, you know, in the past, uh, they got to talking and said, you know, we're signing some country artists. Well, Craig pitched him or just, just uh, gave him the record that Shooter produced. So it came about that uh, they wanted to talk to me and meet with me and everything. And so they wanted to sign a deal with me and I didn't get the deal on the Wayland record at all. This, this came about uh, back in the summer when I was in the office and we're playing songs and stuff. And, and Craig happened to mention that, well, Tommy's got a, uh, an album that Wayland Jennings and, and Jerry Bridges produced that never came out. And they're like, you got what <laughs> you know that type of thing and uh because it was the album was done in probably a 10-year period of uh you know when i was like you know teenagers to um in my 20s they wanted to hear it and so i it was in a box you know and i just kind of i've always thought it was a great album and i didn't ever think it would see the light of day you know again and, you know, Wayland passed away in 2002. And the last stuff we cut was in like 90, 97, I guess. And um, so anyway, I sent, uh, sent the, the stuff to Chuck and, and then he sent it to the office in New York and they, they loved it. And um, they wanted if we put, they could put it out. And I'm like, yeah, because I think it's a great record. And Chuck actually told me, he said, I said, I think this is one of the best country records I've heard in 10 years. And I didn't write any of the songs on it. Um, it was all Dean Dillon and Roger Murrow and Fred Noblock and Troy Seals and, you know, the huge songwriters in Nashville. And uh, Waylon had kind of had collected these songs, you know, and, and had never recorded them. So we went in and started, started doing that. And then, uh, and then as, as I kind of progressed and, you know, got a little bit older and more mature, we went back in and, and did it over. It, it, yeah. All that, is done over a 10 year period of time. Southern Man was one of the first ones we ever did. And then 
uh, Trouble with a Capital T that's coming out uh, Friday. Um, that was one of the last ones we did. So I went back in and re-sang some of the stuff and we did some, you know, redid some stuff on it, you know, uh, wow. it was like Southern, <laughs> Southern man, I was, I was still squeaking and squawking. <laughs> and that was cut, you know. <laughs> Well, that's hey, a great song, a great video. Yeah, exactly. Now, I've, I've told people in, in different interviews that I've done, uh, you know, I was I was young when all of these were cut, but it's like now, you know, 25 years later or whatever, it's like, I think I've lived every song to some degree, you know, whatever. So I can sing them now with more conviction. <laughs> So oh. it was funny, we're, we're getting ready to go do the country music cruise. Uh, it leaves this Friday uh, or Saturday. And um, I was in the, at the rehearsal hall yesterday, uh, rehearsing with the band. And, you know, I haven't seen these songs in such a long time. It was so it's like they're like new songs, you know. Well, speaking of new songs, Tommy, you just mentioned your, your new single, Trouble with a Capital T. And, and, and folks, this song kicks butt with a capital B. Uh, <laughs> how much fun was it recording that? That is an awesome song. Thelma gets around, doesn't she? <laughs> <laughs> always, I've always called the song Thelma. Yeah. Um, and uh, I never, I've never called it Trouble with a Capital T, but that's the proper uh, title. Yeah, that was fun. That that. Uh, Trouble with the Capital T was written by Waylon and Troy Seals. And, you know, Troy has written huge hits. I, and uh, I remember Troy being in the studio uh, the morning we cut that. He's sitting there in the chair, kind of a Waylon, you know, he's just like dancing around in the chair as we're cutting it, you know, that has a snappy little, yeah. little beat to it. And so, yeah, that's a fun one. And it's, uh, we, we actually recorded that song too on a Waymore's Outlaws album. Uh, so we've we've actually played that song quite a bit with, with Wetmore's Allies too. I see behind you, Tommy, mm -hmm. another business that you're in. Yeah. <laughs> Granddaddy Mims Distilling Company. How yeah. did you get in the moonshine business? <laughs> Man, that just fell in my lap. That was nothing that was ever planned at all. Um, uh, I was out... Uh, with a friend of mine, and this is 2011 or 12 or something like that in uh, West Texas. And um, we were driving out just in, out through the dirt roads out there. And he got talking about old moonshiners and stuff. And, and I said, yeah, I said, my grandfather was a pretty famous moonshiner back in North Georgia a long time ago. And uh, Jack is a financial planner and he and I own some publishing together and stuff. Jack Keeter's his name. And um, so, He's like, uh, you think you can get your hands on the recipe? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Why? <laughs> you know? And he was telling me about uh, some money people that he manages, and one of them sold a liquor company for like $400 million or whatever. And um, so it just, it was one thing that led to another. And, uh, and uh, he's like, if you can get your hands on the recipe and we can get a, find a distillery to make it and a distributor in Georgia, he goes, I'll help you get it started. And and we did, and uh, it was my mom's dad, uh, and I don't remember him, um, but uh, we just kind of started it, started it slow, and um, you know, it, we had another distillery making it for a while, and then uh, all the county officials wanted me to put the distillery in my hometown in Blairsville, Georgia, because tourism, or kind of it's in the Appalachian Mountains. Kinda, it's kind of it's a, a very much smaller version of Gatlinburg. Um, but, uh, so we opened the distillery in 2016 and we're, we're up to, you know, we were doing 20, 30 cases a month and now we're doing like over 2,500 cases a month. We're distributed in Florida and Georgia and Tennessee and, uh, Kentucky and Arizona. So, well, that's great. You keep yeah, and, and our and family tradition people. going. Yeah. Yeah. And our, our distillers, uh, the, they've been bootleggers for like 40 years. <laughs> and they were they were so tickled to death to get to do it legally, and, and you know we're not mass produced or anything, and um, we're making it just the way he did in the woods. You know we're not we're not, it's not coming out of a spigot or something. It's uh, it's poured out of our stills back in the bag. <laughs> so that's it's kind of crazy, and I I kind of co-brand the two when I can. So okay, Bill, have you ever had moonshine? 
Yes, but uh, not Granddaddy Mims, but I, but I have. Uh, I've spent. We can fix you guys up. I guarantee you. We'll, well fix you up. I, I'm going to be in know. Georgia. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Where are you yeah. going to Georgia? Uh, my 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 sister lives there in southern Georgia. She's oh. in between. Yeah, yeah, Saint Simons. Okay, yeah, we're way up in North Georgia, right on the uh, North Carolina Tennessee border. Ah, okay. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, we wish you all the best with, with that. And Bill and I look forward. Well, I would say more Bill, because I'm not a big drinker, but but I I, I would he'll drink. probably he'll make me taste it just so he can see my eyes pop out of my head. Yeah. <laughs> you know what moonshine made the right way is uh um is not not take your head off strong. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it uh but yeah, y'all y'all will get a y'all will get some. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah well tommy it has been so much fun talking to you and and you know hearing your your story and your background and how you came up and uh, we wish you all the best with trouble with a capital t aka felma yeah, yeah and uh yeah. and we look forward to to seeing the video and and checking it out as well and we're going to close the show with one of your songs all right so folks, thank you so much for tuning in and we look forward to seeing you next week. And everyone, here is Tommy Townsend. I learn my manners and I learn respect at the end of a willow switch. I learn how to work, you know I learned how to sweat with a shovel in a ditch Learned about love in the backseat of a Chevy With a girl named Mary Ann I learned how to roar till the break of dawn Playing in a honky-tonk man Don't you wonder Mississippi gambler on a boat down to New Orleans. I learned how to fight for my rights in Alabama and how to run from a jealous man. I'm your lifetime friend and your good time buddy when you shake my hand. So